crime and tough on the causes of crime. And it was going to be education, education, education. It would be a new politics. He said, do you remember all this stuff 13 years ago? We would be uncorrupt. That let the people judge us, he said. Well, the people are judging them. And Labour's now on 18% of the vote. The poorest sort of votes they've had since before they fought, entered the national government in 1940. They could be down on 186 seats after the next election, heading towards the minority party status that the Tories had before. But what we have to avoid is what our people have done again and again in generation upon generation and decade upon decade since the Second World War. They despise one of the blocs. They become so seedy and dirty that in the end they chuck them out with an enormous wrath and they get in a wave of new people who make credulous promises and they believe every word, at least for a very short time, and then they turn on them retrospectively. This Tweedledum, Tweedledee nonsense has got to end. I remember in 97 walking up to the polling booth and you have this odd double take on elections, don't you? The media's full of it all the time and you go to the poll and there's hardly anyone there. And all the party people of all the parties come up to you. There's a voter, you know, one of them. And they're sort of excited to see you. And in 97, you could see the anger in people's faces. This was a Tory area. As people went there to get Major out, they hated Major as much as they affect to hate Brown now and actually do hate Brown now. And who did they bring in once they'd slung one lot out? They brought in Tony Blair with his lies and smooth talk. And he only got that job because Mandelson procured it for him and because he was a better front man, front person, New Labour would say, for the New Labour colossus, for their machine. Brown is not a selling proposition, even though he had a honeymoon period for 100 days. Every time I see Brown, he looks older. Have you noticed? He said the one eye's up there, the other eye's down there. The hair was brown to black to grey to white to sort of completely white. The hair is receding. The, the chin gets lower. The face gets lower. He gets sadder and more bulldog-like, more lugubrious, more sort of defeatist and sort of morbid Scotch, you know. He, you really think the poor chap would just give up the job, wouldn't you, and have a bit of a life? But no, he will cling on to that premiership to the last second of the last minute of the last hour of the last day. He will be there at sort of 11 o'clock on polling day, May the 5th or whenever it is, 2010, and he'll be looking at his watch because he's got four minutes more as Prime Minister because he has wanted that job since he was very young. He's a plotter and a sort of conspiratorial politician. When he worked allegedly for Granada TV, he didn't do any work. He used to spend all his time in the cafeteria plotting against other producers. And that's exactly how he's run New Labour, with smears and plots and bringing people down. When Damien McBride, who was his thug internally, who used to impose discipline on people, was revealed doing nasty and naughty emails about various Tories they were going to smear with lies, he had to go. But that's the sort of gang politics that from Fife, via the Scottish Labour Party, through the Labour Party nationally, Brown has brought to bear on our politics. But in the end, the petty corruptions and the power and the rivalry of these people fades in relation to what they have done to Greenwich and what they have done to South London and what they have done to the country itself. Because since 1997, the process of decay that was unavoidably obvious under the Conservatives has been radicalised and extended. Immigration was 100,000 a year prior to New Labour, 300,000 a year under New Labour, consecutively, year on year, and exponentially increasing when you add in the illegals underneath. England is 16% non-white, and our people were never consulted about it. I remember hearing Michael Portillo on the Moral Maze say that every time he confronted the electorate when he was a Tory MP, even a would-be Tory MP, and don't forget this was a man who once had ambitions to lead the Tory party, he's now sadly reduced to being Diane Abbott's mate on various poofets <laughs> and sofas in progressive TV shows and affects to loathe many of the opinions that got him into Westminster in the first place. But let's all put that on the side. He said on Radio 4 that he was embarrassed at times. And somebody said, why? And he replied, the nature of the country, and we know what he means by this, because they all speak in code, the nature of the country has changed out of all recognition and the British people were never consulted about it well. The British people were never consulted about it, and that's true. But he never mentioned that when he was in the um, House of Commons. He never mentioned that when he was an MP for different areas of the South. He never mentioned that when he was a minister in Major's government. And defence minister is an important uh, position in a Tory government. He was once asked, 
What's our defence policy as the United Kingdom? He said, we don't have one. It's decided for us by the United States. And, of course, that's actually a rather trenchant and honest remark, which few politicians would make, because in many respects we have ceased to be an independent country a long time ago. We don't control our own borders. We don't have any real say on our own trade, who, are own, who, all, who owns our major utilities. Our criminality is partly abstracted into the European Union. We fight mercenary-led wars on behalf of American and Israeli power elsewhere in the world, particularly in the Middle East. Until we decouple ourselves from this, we'll be dragged for the next 30 years as America itself declines into more and more of these post-colonial struggles over which we have little control. This week there's been another, an added humiliation in relation to our role in Iraq. Most of our troops have left Iraq, but a few of them stay on to train elements of the Iraqi forces. But the Iraqi parliament, because they allegedly have the sovereignty, now the Americans have ceded it to them, won't allow us to stay. So in a humiliated, tail-between-the-legs sort of way, we've had to repatriate to Kuwait, out of Iraq, and to wait whilst the Iraqi parliament comes back from recess. And although it's a minor matter, and it only obtains to the reality and the destiny of 150 of our troops, it's significant that this is the way this heroic intervention, as Blair called it, has ended and dribbled out into the sand. Iraq war cost us 17 billion we lost upwards of 200 men with 2,500 maimed. We've replaced the Ba'athists by a particular type of Shia Islamist fundamentalism in the South. We've achieved virtually none of our objectives, but we've away obeyed the dictates of the United States. Because again, we are not an independent country when it comes to these matters. And Cameron would do no different. No different to Brown and no different to Blair. Indeed, he was more in favour of this war than most Labour MPs were in their hearts, although they went through the lobbies against their better judgment. The odd one like Claire Short falls away at the 11th hour. But women like Short have connived at processes of destruction that were prior to those developments and that were ongoing. We don't have control of our affairs because we've successively lost them. We've successively lost them because we've been non-nationalistic in relation to almost all post-war developments from about 1948 and the passage of the Nationality Act that began the process which has ended in Brixton and Lambeth and Handsworth and Tuxteth and St Paul's, Bristol and elsewhere now. The process began with the Labour Nationality Act of 1948. Every decision which has basically been made has been progressively neoliberal and downhill in every respect. On law and order, on immigration, on crime, on economic management, on the demography of the country, on the economic welfare of the country, on its diplomatic relationships with other societies. There's going to be major cuts next year. Public spending may go down 10%. We are incredibly in debt. And 16% of 16-year-olds are unemployed. For every trash job in McDonald's, there's 200 applications now because a significant proportion of people in the younger generation are desperate in relation to what's going on. The grace and favour of the 60s and 70s, which only afflicted certain people anyway, has gone. Things are going to get much, much harsher in this country as we decline towards second and then towards third world status, unless there is a definite political desire to revive the fortunes of the society. We're in 2009. Most people in this room are, in some respects, in middling life. Imagine what this country is going to be like on present trends if there is nothing to reverse many of the processes which are ongoing by 2060. Imagine what it's going to be like 100 years from now. 100 years back, we ruled a quarter of the world and were a major superpower. Now we haven't got a pot and rely on the United States for everything. Half of every pound we create goes to fuel the debt that exists under the economy. Everyone in this room is £55,000 in debt. And you may not have any debts at all, but technically, everybody, if you align all the private debt, all the cards, all the store cards, all the credit cards, and all the money to rescue the private sector banks, NatWest is 70% state-owned, you own it, but you have no say over its executives. Why did they adopt these state socialist measures in the last year or two? It was to save the economic system as it presently exists. Because if those banks had gone down you could have 10% unemployed, 20% unemployed, 30% unemployed. The town where I am, about 25% of all retail outlets will fail in the next year to year and a half. And not only will we have one recession, 
we will have one recession which in my opinion will last till the end of this year, then there will be a minor blip about which the media will go berserk, and then we will be hit by another recession. It's the W effect. The two